Welcome to the Let's Get Disruptive podcast. My name is Sean McCleary and I'm excited to bring together some of the leading figures in the tech community to discuss some of the disruptions they have come across in their careers. Whilst it's great to talk about successes and there will be plenty of achievements discussed on these podcasts, I'm a big believer that some of our best learnings come from adapting and overcoming challenges. So we will be exploring our guests' personal challenges, discussing things they have had to overcome from a business perspective, and also covering the many challenges around recruiting and retaining the best people. Our objective is to provoke thought around topical industry challenges and empower listeners with the insight and wisdom from people who have been there, done it, and in fact are still doing it with some of the most disruptive organisations out there. I'm delighted to welcome to our podcast our latest guest, Neil Casey, Global Head of Sourcing and Strategic Hiring at ThoughtWorks. Neil has got a really impressive background, having started out in recruitment on the agency side before working with some of the world's most respected organisations, Oracle, Capgemini, Virgin Media, Logica and Havas, and more recently ThoughtWorks. Neil, I've noted some of your achievements over your 16 years in technology recruitment, from building an award-nominated graduate program for Virgin to overseeing the development and delivery of the largest security sector recruitment program ever undertaken by Logica. Fast forward to your current role as part of the global leadership team in ThoughtWorks during a massive growth period that has seen expansion from 4,000 to 10,000 thought workers across the globe. And I must say, having known you for all of that 16 years in recruitment, you've done this while all while being an all-round top bloke and balancing a great family. So well done, mate. <laughs> um, Neil, I know all of the companies you've worked at, um, ThoughtWorks is probably the one that you're most passionate about. So let's start there. Um, can you give us a bit of background to you, to what it means to be a thought worker? Yeah, well, uh, firstly, Thorn, Sean, Thorn, <laughs> Sean. Yeah, um, you can probably cut that bit. Um, yeah, firstly, thank you very much for the intro. It's um, it has been sixteen years, and I think, despite primarily being in recruitment for that entire time, I think the the variance of of the types of recruitment that organisations do in in the the forms that they take it within their businesses has meant that it's yeah a lot of different challenges. Um, but as you mentioned, the the accumulation of of that experience up to now has brought me to ThoughtWorks. Um, for those that don't know ThoughtWorks, and I'm sure there will be a few out there, um, ThoughtWorks is a global software consulting firm. We've been around for 25 years. What we're probably most, I suppose, well known for in the tech industry is we were part of the original um, group of people who brought Agile to the software industry. We were, helped create the manifesto. Our chief scientist is a gentleman called Martin Fowler, who for many people is seen as sort of the godfather of Agile, if you will. Um, and then from there, we went on to invent things like continuous integration and deployment and the sort of the, the development of that into DevOps, uh, microservice architecture, and a lot of the extreme programming principles that modern day software developers tend to use. So um, the other thing we were quite famous for and more probably appropriate to the recruitment side is for about five or six years, we were probably positioned by Forbes as the hardest tech company in the world to get hired by. Yeah. And one of the top two hardest companies <laughs> in the world to get hired by. We were fighting with McKinsey and Boston Consulting Group for a number of years. Um, and I think what that brought to ThoughtWorks was two things. It brought a, a challenge with regards to hiring the very best people in the world. Um, every company says they do. Yeah. Um, it can be quite daunting when you come to a company that actually does. Um, and the second thing was it made it quite inaccessible. It was like the Wizard of Oz of software companies. It was like no one really knew what ThoughtWorks was. When you're an external person, it was like you have to pull back the curtains to, to find out who's behind there. Um, so becoming a thought worker, um, for me, it, it's, I think it's very rare that you work for a, an organization where you feel you're contributing to something that's bigger than you. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of people generally go to work and they've got a transactional relationship with yeah. the companies that they, they work with. It's just the name on the pay slip. Yes, they enjoy the job. Most of the time it's they enjoy the people who they work with because they're part of a team or they're just personalities. Yeah. Um, but as a mission and as a overall goal, what is that company looking to achieve? And do you personally feel something that, that is something that you feel as a personal goal as well. So can you align to it? Can you fundamentally and emotionally sort of attach yourself to that journey? Yeah. Um, and I think ThoughtWorks is very unique in that, in that way because it, it drives 
that type of relationship it has with its employees. And you feel it. You don't just feel it from yourself. You feel it from everyone around you. There's no one there yeah. on, on a transactional sort of yeah. career path. It's it's about actually how are they going to do the best that they can to impact ThoughtWorks. Of course. I know it's interesting you say that. I think um, more and more we're seeing in recruitment that one of the biggest drivers, particularly for graduates these days, is 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 feeling um, aligned to a company's purpose and being able to buy into that purpose, as, as you've touched on there. So linked into that, something that um, from doing my research, ThoughtWorks are also famous for is, is around social justice and yeah. change. So can you just expand on that and what that means again yeah. to, to the business? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very interesting point, actually. So, um, and just to touch on your previous one, because you mentioned the term thought worker, which I never referenced. Yeah. Um, now for a lot of people, obviously the fact that you're called a thought worker does, it sort of gives you a, an indication of the, the, the sort of being part of something. Um, for a lot of people in the external industry, that, that was seen as quite cultish. Oh, okay, um, and I mean, don't get me wrong, you get a robe and a candle when you join. Um, so it, it, yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I think it, it again, it's, it's, it's more representative of the, the alignment to the business that most of our people have or all of our people have. But in terms of social justice, um, from the background of this, the founder of ThoughtWorks, it, it, it really stems from that. So the founder of ThoughtWorks was a gentleman called um, Roy Neville Singham, um, known primarily as Roy. And Roy was a, or is a, uh, political activist. Um, very, yeah. very uh, much a active and vocal participant in the social justice movement. Um, he saw ThoughtWorks as an organization that could not only disrupt the technology industry and find the, the brightest thinkers and the, the best problem solvers to create different solutions for clients. Yeah. But he also saw us as an opportunity to impact society in a way that um, looked at technology and its impact in the communities around us. Yeah. How do we strive for more accessible and more inclusive technology? How do we impact the world around us and be aware of our own privilege? Yeah. Um, as we all know, for a long time, especially in the 80s and, and early 90s, technology was a primarily the the industry of white middle class males um, are in the Western world. Yeah. Um, and as we've seen a globalization of that, it's how do we use that globalization to empower new careers and technologies with, um, around the world, whether it be in India or um, anywhere in the Southeast Asia or South America, yeah. and, and how do we advocate for those type of things. But ThoughtWorks, as an organization, um, we built that into the DNA of the business. Yeah. So it was a factor of how did we identify new talent? Did they see the world in a similar way? Did they, were they aware of their privilege? Were they aware of things that are going on? Yeah. And even if they weren't, were they interested in finding out a, a bit more, more about it and being on that learning journey? Yeah. Um, so that was the background to it. As you'd imagine, we're 25 years old now oh. or 27 as it is. Um, and that's evolved over time. It's involved with the business. It's, it's, um, formalized itself in different ways, whether it's global working groups that specialize in that part of what we do yeah. and formalize it into more of a, a polished approach. Um, it's also taken part of actually what our business is structured in. So when we originally looked to restructure the business about 12 years ago, I think it was, um, someone will probably correct me on that, but I think it was about 12 years ago. Uh, the business was, uh, we, we had some time on a, a, a business wide, uh, company dear, where the founders of Ben and Jerry's came in. Okay. Um, and they'd structured their business around th a three pillar model. And their three pillar model for their, for Ben and Jerry's was around pillar one, which was um, commercialized st sustainable business. Yeah. So how does that business run? How does it generate money? How does it invest? How does it do all the things that a, a business within that space would want to do? Pillar two was around its product specialism and the quality of its product. Yeah. Um, and pillar three was around its cultural aspects and how does it build itself around that? So when ThoughtWorks were thinking about restructuring, they used the three pillar model to sort of build itself around the, the values that ThoughtWorks had. And that was again, sustainable business for pillar one. Yeah. It was what we call software excellence yeah. for pillar two. That was yeah. the type of work we do, the quality of work, yeah. avoiding non-interesting, non-cutting edge type work yeah. that you would associate with large systems integrators. Like that sort of, what can ThoughtWorks do to, to be ThoughtWorks yeah. and, and differentiate itself. And then pillar three was around social justice and how does social justice play a part and how do we create that social moral compass in all of the decisions that happen at ThoughtWorks, whether it's client selection, whether it's yeah. type of work, whether it's the things that we advocate for, the way that we utilize our 
office space? How do we invite groups in? How do we create solidarity with causes that we um, are passionate about? Yeah. So that formed part of, again, part of the DNA. And it got to the stage from a recruitment perspective where a major part of the interview process was a social justice interview. Yeah. Where it, it it raised, and it was always the favorite part of the interview that candidates had, <laughs> but it raised questions that you would never normally get. Of course. It would, like, like sort of questions where you really had to think it wasn't just about your CV. It yeah. wasn't just about your subject matter. Yeah, yeah. It was actually, what do you think about lack of diversity within yeah. tech? Or what would you do differently? How do you see historical um, privilege and all of these type of things that people wouldn't have been asked before? Yeah. And it's not about always being an activist. It's not about being uh, a sort of a, a very well-versed left-wing socialist who, who's already very well-educated in that space. Do we have some of those? Absolutely. Yeah. Do they drive an engine of activity in that area because they're very passionate about it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And it's yeah. all for the better. But it's about actually taking people on that journey and for people wanting to grow personally as well as from a professional perspective. Brilliant. Uh, and look, it's great to hear that because you hear a lot about culture and values and it tends to be those three pillars look great on a website, but actually bringing it into the hiring process and making it a big part of that process is really good Good to see. So Yeah, and uh, it's it's funnily enough that in, it, we obviously have that filter to drive cultural growth and make sure that our culture is always evolving. It's not about everyone looking this. If everyone has the same opinions on everything, you never get healthy debate. You never get challenges. You never get sort of thinking that you need in order to grow. Um, but it also, it, what it was really good for is it just reduces the amount of people who were just really different, like in terms of very not, a, not a cultural fit. Of course. Um, but they would not, for most of the places I've worked, they probably wouldn't have been a cultural fit anywhere. Yeah, yeah, it's just, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just not, not great. So it's been, it's been good from that perspective and the amount of people we've had to, the amount of attrition we've had yeah. in the business due to people not being a culture fit yeah. is is quite, considering the amount of growth we do yeah. is minimal. That's good to hear. Okay. You touched on the global element of ThoughtWorks and, you know, just by trying to pin you down on this podcast, I think we were doing it in between you being in Brazil, China and India over the last yeah. month. So. Oh, my wife's not listening to this because yeah, it's still exactly. raw. It's still quite I raw. Can imagine. Um, I can imagine. So how, how do you find experiencing these different cultures from your po yeah. personal point of view and, and what's their approach to technology? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting, interesting point around region to region. It's the level of maturity and it's not just around technology. It's around business practices, processes, market conditions. Um, and until you've actually experienced that, it's, it, it's very difficult because you think everything, everyone does the same as you. And as a recruiter, you yeah. think, or as someone who's leading a recruitment, you think, why don't other regions just do the same way as we're doing it? Because we get results and, um, that should work in every region. And it's like a blanket sort of statement. It's like almost imperialistic about the view. It's like not taking local anything into account. Um, so being able to visit people and, and putting faces to names and getting an idea of what their world really looks like has been incredibly eye-opening. I've done a global work before, but trying to drive change in different regions has been the biggest part. Um, and as you mentioned earlier this year, being in South America and last year and, and next week, I'm going to be in India. The differences in what we're seeing now in, in the globalization of tech. So South America, for instance, you've got Chile, you've got Ecuador, where historically it was, it was a, a consumer of tech, but it was never, it was never a driver of tech in terms of being the origin, originator of building software. Awesome. We're now seeing that more and more. We're now seeing more co oh, consultancies okay. going in there. Yeah. Um, and then the traditional, what you'd probably call the outsourced distribution centers of tech build, yeah. China, India, yeah. they're, I suppose what you would call their their own economies, their their Indian economy, the China economy, they're building such strong client bases internally in their own markets that they're actually building their technology for their own markets. They're not just not just the receiver of technology requests from from westernized markets. Oh. So what we're seeing is they're now distributing software development to Thailand. Yeah. So India's distributing to Thailand, China's distributing to Singapore. They're both distributing, North America's distributing to South America. Um, so we're seeing diff a different pattern now of where the, the upcoming technology hubs are, are, are being delivering, are delivering from. And, and it's to see that maturity coming through is, is really good. But what we have got in place is we've got a lot of learning. So when, Thailand's been developing, when India's maturing, we've been able to pick a lot of learnings out of those things, such as just having best practice processes, cultural shift changes. Um, 
ThoughtWorks, as I mentioned, we've gone from, we took us 25 years to get to 4,000 people. It, like literally, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the bar was always anecdotally very, very high. And I say anecdotally, it was very high, but there was an anecdotal um, badge of honor. Yeah. Um, there was always a case of if we recruit any more than what we're doing now, then the bar has to drop. Yeah. But we were only crew recruiting probably 800 people around the world globally. Yeah. Now, in a market of X million technologists, yeah, is yeah. there only 800? <laughs> the answer is no, of course. Yeah, of course. There's, there's miles more. It's just a case of how do we identify them? How do we look at the most efficient and effective ways? Yeah. Um, one of the famous stats of ThoughtWorks was it took, um, it was, I think at one point it was 100 to 1. Wow. In terms of up, like applications, kind of ta- application to, yeah, that's interesting. Which was again, it was oh well, it's hard. It's hard to get in ThoughtWorks, and it isn't through the SES. Yeah. And it was like, well, that just tells me you don't really know what you're looking for, because oh. why wouldn't you just speak to more of the right type of profile? Yeah. Um, and when you look then into where people get candidates from in region to region, yeah. the less much the, the less mature markets are still very inbound orientated. Yeah, um, especially in regions like India, where the volumes of profiles are so high that it makes it in- incredibly difficult to to manage conversion rates. At one point in India last year, we were doing 316 applications for every one hire. Wow. Now, if you're a recruiter sat at a desk, yeah, that's a opening challenge. your inbox in the morning, it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it makes it a challenge. Um, but yeah, I think those are the biggest things, that the different maturing model, maturity models around the world and how do you drive change in those regions. The majority of the time, it's just effective communications. It's um, understanding regional market, but backing it up with data. Whoa. Data is international. Yeah. You could go to Mars and you could use the data to yeah. actually build an argument around it because it doesn't it doesn't lie. As long as you're using consistent data and you've got that clean, then you can build a proposition around that that everyone will understand and, and move on. Fantastic. Focusing on the north then for a second, yeah. as you're a northern lad at heart, although yeah. we can't tell with the, the posh accent you've now got, yeah. as I am. Um, so Manchester's at, the Midlands, isn't it? Well, if you, yeah, the, if you look so at the north map. North of Watford, apparently, yeah. is anywhere north. But um, <laughs> no, I think, look, what, what I was really impressed, just little things from the Manchester office from ThoughtWorks was, you know, the meeting room names, uh, Turing, Emmeline and Hacienda, if I remember yeah. rightly with a bit of a nod culturally to Manchester. Um, how have you seen Manchester grow as a digital city since you've been involved in it? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's phenomenal. I mean, it's, it, then again, that's an easy term to throw about. I think if you look at the evolution of Manchester over the, over the, the last, probably even the last five years, um, I mean, I remember coming back to Manchester more day to day when I, when I joined ThoughtWorks, cause I was, I was responsible for, for Manchester and UK recruitment out of Manchester. And we were seeing, that I, I generally judge it on where's the competition. Where's the competition for engineers? Where are we seeing people going to work-wise? Because it's, it's, it's a good temperature check on, on what the market's doing. And um, we started to see an increase about four years ago of a the commercial sector industry was, was they historically were never a destination for developers. Working for, I mean, I'm going to throw a few names around, but it's, it's, it's probably it just because they're top ahead, like auto trader. Yeah. Late Rooms, Cause. Asda, Tesco, yeah. Yeah. Sainsbury's. Yeah. They weren't really tech businesses. Yeah. They were retailers. Banks weren't really tech business. They were just financial services companies. And I think as we've seen the, the industry change, so, I mean, if everything's digitized now, if you're not a retailer that's becoming a tech business with retail offerings, or you're not a bank that's becoming a financial services business with sort of fintech yeah yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it, it's it's just like it's always driven by tech now and you find on the high street we see hundreds of big names going under that that historic were historical market leaders because they haven't evolved yeah. most of them are blaming the high street it's not it's just lack of transformation within their own business um so we're seeing that and i think that's been that's what i've seen in manchester so coming back there was an increase in in commercial um, space technology and, and driving real change in that space. Also the startup scene, some of your smaller consultancies, some of your small di- digital agencies, yeah. um, the traditional marketing agencies yeah, they're not um, tech focused, aren't they? are now digital agencies. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're not just print anymore. They are driving websites. They're driving front end stuff. Some of them are expanding into full stack platform build. Um, so there's legitimate career opportunities for technologists to be able to have credible technology offerings within these organizations. And then you, on top of that, you've got the traditional big players, like your big systems integrators, your Capgemini's, your Oracle's, your, 
your IBMs all have presence around the Northwest. Um, they sit as like a big shadow over the industry because you wouldn't you do you wouldn't say they had an office in Manchester, but yeah. they've probably got three or four. Right. Um, so all of these things are happening uh, at one time over over the last four years, and that's that's really evolved. And then nowadays we're seeing Amazon opening up next door to ThoughtWorks. Of course, yeah, yeah. Um, we've seen Amazon. We've seen lo- uh, all the talk talks. All of them are relocating to Manchester. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's been driven by a number of factors. Any industry growth now, regardless of sector, has an impact in tech yeah. because they're all tech businesses. So yeah, it doesn't matter whether you're retail, doesn't matter your media, um, and Manchester's the absolute forefront of that. We're seeing now in Manchester what we probably saw ten years ago in in the Shoreditch areas and yeah. places like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously looking in the northern quarter where we're having smaller smaller startups, oh. they're now relocating to spinning fields. Yeah. Yeah. After three or four years. Yeah, and yeah. it's just like, right, well, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's picked up traction. So yeah, it's it's a phenomenal place to be. Yep. Nothing more than where we're based now in Ancoats is no, absolutely. You know, seeing, that, he, seeing that growth as well. And I mean, the regeneration that comes with it also. Yeah, I mean I, I know the area somewhat, but yeah. I've never been to this office yeah, before. Yeah. And just walking here was like, yeah. right, okay. And coming in, it <laughs> yeah. was just it was like, wow, there's there's it just the level of investment is yeah, yeah. impressive. Yeah. Um so yeah, it's it's there's a Manchester's never been, I mean, Man- Manchester historically has always been like the, the cool city in yeah. the UK. Yeah, I don't yeah. care what anyone says. It's yeah. always been the, <laughs> I'd agree. The, yeah. the cool city because it doesn't have the, the pomp and circumstance of you get what you get in London. Yeah. Um, but it also has the level of relationship and, and like warmth that you get from the North. Of course. But now it's, it's a legitimate digital hub, yeah. um, with Manchester, um, airport doing as much as it is. Yeah. Huge interactions now with the Chinese market. Um, and then you've got companies driving like UK fast who are, who are expanding and being an international player. It's yeah, it's, it's really put itself in the crosshairs. Brilliant. Um, we've talked a lot about your achievements. So a big part of this podcast is also looking at times when things haven't gone to plan and, and ultimately learnings from those challenges that our listeners could take away, I suppose. So I'm going to put you on the spot. You, you're probably used to failures as a Sunderland fan, <laughs> um, but from a professional point of view, um, can you share any experience of failures or things that haven't gone so well? Yeah. Well, they're learned? the best ones. Yeah. They are the best ones because yeah. you don't learn that much. You learn some things from your successes, but success sometimes comes business as usual. And oh. when it does, that's when people start to get on the totter of, of failure. So I've had a few, I think the worst thing that happened to, I think the, 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 the first thing I saw, um, personally as a, as a starting point was, um, when I first went into recruitment, so you, you'll probably have some visibility of this cause you were in the same business at the same time. I, um, I started off pretty quickly and I generally got hold of recruitment. It was like one of those things where, yeah, I, I can do this. This is pretty cool. I can do this. But then after it only takes you so far, having, being able to close, being able to be good on the phone, all of those things takes you so far. The reality is there's a underlying, it's like the old iceberg analogy. Yeah. It's like everyone, when the, when everyone's watching you close a candidate, it's brilliant, yeah. but it's all the work that goes on under the surface to get you to that point where most people fail yeah. because they're not prepared to do it. Yeah. Um, and I was absolute victim of that. Yeah. It was like something shiny, made a few deals. Yeah. Next, next world. Swanning great, around. Great, well, yeah. Swanning around, <laughs> ringing bells. Um, and it was like, at that point I was like, I'm not sure whether it was like two hours on the phone. It was like, do I really want to do that? And I thought at the time, I think, but I think when you're young in your first career, you don't have that level of self-awareness of what you enjoy, what you're good at, what you want to do. I think some people do. That's amazing. I, I applaud if you can, if you can hit the bullseye straight away and get on your career path straight away, I think it's, it's amazing. But I didn't, I thought I've got, got into that and got to a certain point. And then I saw people who I thought, you know what, they're good recruiters, but, like sort of that, I, I, I would, I would bat myself against them on a closing call. Yeah. And it's like, but that's not the, that's like, it's easy to finish when you're tapping the ball in on the yeah, line. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. um, that's been in the six yard exactly, box. Exactly. Yeah. Time. And I think, I think that's where I, I sort of had the learning around that. So I, I moved out of, um, working in the agency world and I went to work for Oracle. Yeah. Um, and it was a complete difference. So I think I'd gone through that sort of initial failure of actually not being as good as I thought I was. And not really at the point in time where I was open enough to admit why about the work ethic and about doing the, the hard graft bit. Yeah. Um, and I think I went through Oracle. Oracle was an amazing experience because it gave me globalized, it globalized approach. It gave me autonomy. I was responsible for things. So I couldn't 
not to do it. So yeah. it forced me to be a bit more organized. Yeah. So that, I think that matured me quite a bit. But the, And then I went into um, RPO, which is, uh, for those who don't know, RPO is recruitment process outsourcing. It's where basically companies outsource their recruitment delivery. So they'll hire a recruitment function that comes in and are branded as the organization, but you end up being a, a service provider to the company you work for. Yeah. And I found that for about five, six years doing that, it was fantastic to under- get the more commercial knowledge, build executive stakeholder skills, all of those type of things. Um, and after five years, because you're not on the front end of recruitment, you're more project program managing. It was, um, I just got a bit bored of it. Yeah. Um, and this is where it comes to my first failure. And at this point I was sort of doing the usual thing of working up the career band, getting a better title, more prestige, all of this sort of stuff within the, the world I was in. And, um, I got, randomly out of the blue, I got contacted by a company called Havas. Um, and for those who don't know, Havas are probably the top three largest agencies, digital creative agencies in the world. Um, they're a huge organization, very polished, very, very marketing agency. Everything's fantastic. Um, and I was asked to come in to run, um, a part of their business, which specialized in, um, recruitment technology an ATS applicant tracking system. Um, and for me, it was like, Oh, that sounds good used to implementing ATS systems off through the roles I've had. Um, it's different and the job title's better. Yeah. It was director. It was like, oh, fantastic. That's yeah. exactly the sort of thing I should do. The money was better. Um, and because of that, I was just blinded by that. And I should have, I, I never asked the questions of either my, I never asked the questions of myself and I never asked the questions of the company that I probably should have. Um, and what I found, and you know, when you do something and you instantly know, hmm, I'm not sure whether this is right. And it was literally within the first month I was, I'm, pr- yeah, I, I just knew. What triggered that, do you think? What, what, what kind of made you feel like that? Well, this isn't right? well, you know me quite well. And, and I would probably, if, if, if anyone, if quite a few people, if they were to describe me as an animal, they would say I was a Labrador retriever. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> Labrador Retriever, always that, happy, yeah, yeah. yeah always laugh, that. always, always, always. One with um, a shiny coat, yeah, though. shiny, <laughs> yeah, yeah, good, well brushed, um, but full of energy, yeah, always positive, yeah. Dry, like literally can just drive change through positivity and and influence, but likes a job to do, of course, like literally go yeah. throw the ball, throw yeah. the ball, throw yeah. the ball, yeah, but I've, and I've got to be passionate about that ball. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's a yeah. job I want to do, and I'm, yeah. if I'm not passionate about something, yeah, people can tell very quickly, yeah, it's like well, what's wrong with Neil? Yeah. Because he's like the firework. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll just throw Neil in there to, to get people moving type thing. Um, and I just found out very quickly that I was, regardless of it being recruitment technology, it was technology. It was just, it was software. Yeah. And I've, for an industry that I've spent my life in, I was never, I've never been a software delivery manager. Yeah. I've never been sort of responsible for the, for the upkeep of the software and the working with clients about their interactions with the software. And it's the people side. Of it's it the people, people side. Yeah. That I've always, and I, I found that very quickly, I just wasn't interested. And if I'm not interested, if I'm not like sort of cerebrally brought in, bought into the, to the, what I'm doing, yeah. I find it very difficult to motivate myself. So yeah, I just got into that rut of, I know I'm not doing a very good job because I don't want to do it. I'm, I'm not interested. Yeah. And it was just like torture. Yeah. And it was, so I had nine months of that and, I feel like probably I'll let the people down that I was leading at the time. Cause I was running, I was running a, a, a decent sized team. that's sort of 15 to 20 people. Yeah. Um, they never got the best of me. Um, but I never got the best of myself. Like literally after nine months, it was, it was a month before Christmas. And, um, even my wife was sort of saying, you're, I went on holiday, I went to Mallorca and, uh, she was very open and honest about it. She said, you're not yourself. Yeah. And it's the first time of me, really feeling very different to how I'd normally be okay. and uh, waking up and just like dreading going to work. I've never had that. That Sunday anxiety. Oh, it was like, but it, it was just like day to day anxiety. Yeah, yeah. It was like, what's going to go wrong next? Right. It was like, yeah, yeah. Never, and I, I, you can quickly get into that spiral. I mean, I don't think I got anywhere near the levels that a lot of people suffer with. Of course. Because I think that obviously that's thrown around and I think it's, yeah. I think I, I identified it pretty quickly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I was very lucky that I had a support network that, that could that could help me make the decisions that I needed and give me the support to have confidence to make those 100%. decisions, which resulted in me a month before Christmas with two young children resigning without a job. And I never had much savings, so it wasn't as if I could, I like had the luxury of, because I always think when people resign, it's like, oh, you must have had a, the yeah, luxury yeah. of being able to. Yeah, yeah. Like, no. I've seen the gadgets that you've yeah. got, you've probably not got any savings. Yeah, no, yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> yeah, fluid. Yeah, liquid. Um, <laughs> 
but yeah, it's, and that, so I got to a point there where it was like, right, what am I going to do? Yeah. And um, I'll be honest, I actually had an interview as a representative of the salt that gets delivered to car parks in supermarkets. Wow, I never knew that. So there's a company that <laughs> delivers the salt in um, tonne bags. And it was this South African guy. <laughs> Um, and he was absolutely brutal. He was like, so you just let me get this right. You've just been client services director for one of the biggest digital agencies in the world. And now you want to be a local rep for salt. You were there in your sharp suit. And, you know, I saw, <laughs> hey, you never lose recruitment. I sold him the dream. I work hard, don't but we? you got an offer though still, didn't you? I never, I, yeah. I, well, <laughs> thankfully before I had to make that decision, um, I, I sort of had a bit of a sit down and think of what, what I actually want to do. And, um, I got a bit of advice of just go and do a contract role, yeah. go and do a contract role, get back to just some normality, take the pressure out. And I ended up going joining a company in uh, Preston, a company called at the time were called Test Direct. And I'd originally looked at it for a contract role, but um, it, t- it, it before I even joined, it turned into a permanent job. So um, I joined them as UK head of recruitment and just got back into the swing of hands-on recruitment, of just speaking to candidates, managing the business, yeah. sort of closing candidates and... Um, I put in my notes, it, it felt a bit like, um, it felt like I was back doing what I was meant to be doing. It's like, I'd realized that was like the, the sort of realization of what I should be doing. Oh. And, um, I sort of noted that it was like at the end of the matrix when Neo gets shot <laughs> and everyone thinks he's dead. <laughs> yeah. And then he gets up and realizes he that himself. he's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and he's like, no. <laughs> and that was, it, that just sort of felt like this is what I'm meant to be doing. And yeah, from yeah. that point, all of the background of, doing the hard work, all of the graph that I've put in over the years just automatically clicked in. And it was like, right, okay, I get this. Um, and because I'd been on the other side of the fence of knowing when it goes wrong, there was an inbuilt safety mechanism of this is never going to happen again. Yeah. And it's, you know what, if this fails again, it's not because I haven't done the hard work. Yeah. It's not because I ha- can't be bothered to do it. And I know if I'd have done something different, it would have gone, it's something in my control that will never happen again. Yeah. So I was at, I was at, um, Test Direct for about six months and we do, had a really I had a really good time there. It rebuilt the sort of the confidence and all of those type of things. Um, and then I had the opportunity of joining ThoughtWorks. Um, ThoughtWorks were a company in the testing space that were really well known because it built a couple of products like Selenium and they were responsible for test-driven development. So it again, it was like the pinnacle of, of the area that I was focusing on. So I did turn up to ThoughtWorks for my interview in a three-piece suit because I was working in the real world. I turned up and it was like back to the future too when he goes to the, it was like like everyone wearing sort of uh, boots that dry themselves and uh, different color and different color hairs and all sorts. It was like, right, okay. So I think I am the only person ever to be hired at ThoughtWorks in a three-piece, in a three-piece suit. suit. Nice. Um, so I joined there and joined the UK team and um it's, it was like, literally, again, it was just, it was like a click straight away. Yeah. ThoughtWorks had gone through a long period of time where on average recruiters had minimum targets, yeah. but targets were a, a pretty, uh, not very highly used word at ThoughtWorks. Right. Um, it was very much around doing things in the right way. But I think metrics and management of operations in general was quite immature within the business, considering how much of a polished delivery business we were for our clients. So going in and just putting best practices around recruitment in and just delivering as a, as a good recruiter meant yeah. that we could start to redefine what recruitment was meant to be doing at ThoughtWorks. And f- like literally sort of, I think the record for a recruiter in, in the UK was hiring about 16 people in a year. Um, and I think in my second year I did 89. Wow. So it was, but that was, and I tell everyone the same thing. <laughs> yeah. That's not me being magic. That's yeah, yeah. just doing the basics. Course. That's like doing the, working out what you need to do, yeah. doing it. Yeah. Um, so I think the, the major, the major failure I had has been the fundamental driver of everything that's gone on from the, the, the next four years, five years of my career to where I am today. So, yeah, but I think those type of things, you've got to be open. You've got to be self-reflective. You've got to understand where you are responsible for the failure, but also where you're not responsible, what could you have done different? There's always, there's always a level of influence at some point, if you go back far enough where you could have adapted it. And there's sometimes you can't do anything. And I think you can only, I think there's a famous quote of you can control the controllables. Otherwise you go crazy. Yeah. yeah. I think the more things you can bring into that, I think a lot of people don't, remember that bit. Yeah. It's like, I'll, I'll just control what I've got. And yeah. it's like, well, no, you should you try and bring, bring that, yeah. you should try and bring more into that circle. Yeah. Um, but there will be certain things that you'll never be able to, to get hold of. So I think, yeah, that those, that, that incident and that, that sort of situation, 
I would say is probably, as you said, you, we call it a failure, we call it a, a, a challenge, but I, I would say it's probably the best thing that's happened in my career because it's it's been the foundation for everything else afterwards. Brilliant. Um, you, we, we always ask people around kind of disruption as a theme. Um, you're working for a really disruptive company, but I'd like, I'd be interested to know what do you see looking at 2020 as a potential disruptor in the industry? From a tech perspective, yeah. Um, can I give you, I'll give you two. I'll give you from a tech perspective, but I'll also give you from a tech, because obviously I'm from the talent acquisition yeah, world. Exactly. So recruitment I'll talk to you a little bit about the recruitment side as well. So from a, from an industry perspective, we're still, I think what we're seeing now is that people are, uh, are not as frequently talking about digital transformation. Yeah. Um, over the last four years, you probably, digital transformation was the buzzword. Yeah. It was like, but what does that mean? Does that mean getting a new system from Oracle and like, literally just rebranding yourself or does it, um, yeah, what does it mean? So I think that's sort of gone through the, um, the ringer a little bit. And then I think everyone moved to using cloud as a bit of a buzzword. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's, that's probably gone the, the way of the, um, the dodo, but I think we're now getting to the stage where it's critical for organizations to look at more of their, their own platforms as a platform for change. So again, I mentioned some of the sort of the larger big vendor software systems. And I think for a long time, people have, have bought into them. Um, and I think that there, there there's a grow, there's a, there was a growing market for companies who wanted to move away from their big ERP systems. Yeah. Um, that's been a, a continuing theme for a number of years, but I think the point, the tipping point of, of having to make lightweight reactive systems within their plat like within their businesses platforms that can help them pivot and change and yeah. um i mean a, a prime example would be auto trader who've done it really well i mean the fact that they sell cars is by the by of course um it really is i mean amazon's another great example of of they can drive any business offering from the platforms that they have yeah um they're not restricted by the tech they're not restricted by the the internal systems or anything like that or the processes they they have the ability to pivot and change direction quickly yeah. um so i think that will become more frequent. I think also that, that we're seeing continued challenge from from lightweight players, yeah. Um, Monzo, yeah, Atoms, N N twenty six. Um, all of those players are coming through that yeah. disrupt the uh, the banks. Um, the banks now are starting to completely change their offering. So I think that we see, we'll see more of that. Um, one of the big factors as well is that Google is going to be changing its search optimization piece. Right. Um, so historically, everyone's website had to be search search engine optimization. Yeah. They're now apparently changing it towards Google, uh, mobile. So if unless your website is mobile, mobile optimized, yeah. um, it won't rank as highly within Google searches, which will have a massive difference for, for businesses. Yeah. Um, It'll also change the search engine optimization industry. Um, so I think that's going to be a big piece. Um, from a recruitment point of view, um, we're seeing in more, in, I mean, obviously recruitment agencies are continuing to expand. We see more every year, but I think that the biggest piece I'm seeing right now is the transformation and the maturity around the direct sourcing technology. Um, years ago, it was job boards. Your monsters. St if you looked at the stats, they're still indeed in monster. They're still the number one source of candidates. If you looked cross sector in every level, of course. Um, however, if you're focusing more on tech, we've the job boards have, have made way over a number of years for things like LinkedIn. Yeah, um, we're now seeing the evolution again of of people moving away from LinkedIn into more talent matching systems. So it's almost like a, an, al an amalgamation of, of job boards and LinkedIn. So you have candidates who are proactively on platforms that match them almost like in a, a dating platform type oh, way. Okay, yeah. um, so organizations like Hired, um, Caru in the, in, in Manchester, yeah. those, those platforms are, are driving more of an interactive relationship between the, the employer and the candidates yep. than they've ever had really. Um, and I think I know, ThoughtWorks, for instance, we've used Hired ex extensively um, over the last two years, and the quality conversion of Hire is probably twenty percent higher. So we 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 spend twenty percent less time on calls to candidates to make hires yeah. than we did through previous um, methods, and the response rates are a lot higher as well. So I would see a lot more organisations looking to try and um, engage those type of systems, and um, they're engaging with them on different platforms like GitHub or, yeah. you know, so, so it's interesting that that's all being brought together. Under yeah, one platform. absolutely. Um, I mean, my job at ThoughtWorks, I know you mentioned it earlier, so as global head of sourcing, and I suppose what that means is, um, so I have a team of specialists in, in Pune in India, right. um, who are, they're, 
I mean, uh, it's again, I know people use the term world leaders, but I've got people who have won international sourcing competitions. These people, find, uh, it's like, I, I, <laughs> if I ever get on the wrong side of them, they're going to find so much out about me that they don't want me to, they don't want me to know about. But um, yeah, the, I, the, they're unbelievable. But the, with the globalization of tech and LinkedIn and, and GitHub and Stack Overflow and all of these tools, we deliver hundreds of candidates around the world um, for for the recruiters in the regions to be able to come in on a Monday morning and they could have 15 calls already lined up in their, in their calendar of eight, like sourced candidates, yeah. um, which is a major difference to where we were. It's like an engine. Um, so yeah, I think that's potentially for larger scale organizations. They might look to try and changer. create something like that as well. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, to bring it to a close then, Neil, um, I always ask my podcast guests to think about quotes um that are or people or scenarios that resonated with them during difficult times i know you're a man for a quote so yeah i might be interested to get taught to me w- what does that say to you yeah i think i'll there's a couple there's a couple of people who i i tend to look to with regards to um inspiration and i think uh one of them i i i, I I know you know, but just for the listeners' benefit, I do um, something called CrossFit, which is a bit of an exercise program stroke sport. Um, And I've been doing that now since 2009. Um, There's a a guy who's basically dominated that sport for the last four years, a guy called Matt Fraser out of the US. And um, there's been a lot of documentaries made on him. And and one of the things that he does, which I find very, it resonates really, I suppose, with what I was talking about earlier about the iceberg and the work is that in order to be successful, and his quote was, you have to be prepared to do the things when nobody's watching. Yeah. It's the stuff you do when nobody's watching that makes a difference. Definitely. Um, or, and there was another one he came out with, which was, I'm prepared to do today what no one else is so I can do tomorrow what no one else can. Brilliant. Love it. And I, th- I just I just thought that was great because when you're a recruiter, and I mean, if there's recruiters listening to this, when you out there on a night, yep. sat at your desk at seven o'clock or yep. whatever it is, looking for CVs or you're in early to do calls and no one else is around you. Those are the things that are going to make a difference between being good or being great. Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, Matt, Matt um, Frazier is a, a, I think that for me is, is one of the big things. Brilliant. Thank you, Neil. Great to have you on. No, thank you very much, John. Thanks for listening to the Let's Get Disruptive podcast. Please subscribe, rate and review.